that's less than one minute. So <laughs> hello, everybody. Um, I, this is Bob. I hope you all had a good week um, and uh, look forward to today's session. Um, and uh, as we've done in the past, before we get going any further, I want to just make sure we say thanks to all of the co-sponsors, many of which are you are part of one of these organizations. So thank you for co-sponsoring the community of practice. Um, and also, I just want to say thanks to all of you who attended the special session last week. We had a really good discussion, thought it was really good, and we wished it had gone on for four hours because I think there was a lot more to talk about, but we just didn't get that time. But thanks for joining us. And also, if you're interested in the next special session, which is going to focus on working with youth, um, the folks from the Mycelium Youth Network who focus specifically on youth and climate change are going to join us for that session. That's in two weeks, I guess, on the Thursday. So I just want to flag that for you. Um, uh, so just again, uh, as I always do to start off with, our key message is that community is medicine, that uh, through human history, it's when we have banded together as groups, as people, uh, that we've been able to respond creatively and adapted to these very complex problems. And we can do this again now if we work at the community level. So we, our job is to keep remembering that a trauma can be passed down generation by generation, historical, intergenerational traumas, et cetera, then so can healing and transformational resilience. And that's what I hope uh, over time, if, if not already, you've all sort of get from this um, community practice and begin to practice it. Um, so I just want to start with a brief summary of what we've covered so far, uh, just to bring everybody up to speed. The first session described how the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe is already and will increasingly generate many known and likely many never before seen types of chronic stresses and acute impacts that produce widespread individual community and societal traumas. So in response, we've got to think and respond at the scale of the challenges that we face ahead. And this requires engaging entire communities and neighborhoods and using a public health approach to build and sustain population level mental wellness and transformational resilience. During the second session, um, we heard from, uh, talked about and heard from folks who helped us understand ways to form resilience coordinating networks, whatever you want to call it in your community, that develop multi-systemic strategies, that is strategies to deal with many different forms of stresses and traumas for many different populations that help shift a community from trauma organized to resilience enhancing. Last week, uh, we heard from two speakers uh, who described uh, how, how effective and powerful it could be to begin building community capacity for mental wellness and resilience by actively engaging residents in activities that begin to heal their traumas. I wish we had more time to, to hear some of the skills uh, and actually practice ones that the uh, Center for Mind-Body Medicine uh, runs people through, but you're gonna hear from other organizations later in the community practice that do something similar and or engaging residents in mapping out from a systems perspective, how specific actions create more trauma, which create more responses, et cetera, and became trauma organized. Uh, so there's numerous methods available, we learned, to begin building community capacity by engaging residents in activities that heal their trauma. Each community, each neighborhood should choose one that matches the type and the scale of the need, the culture, and the resources that are available locally. But whatever is a, a chosen, uh, it should be used as a catalyst, not just to heal the traumas, but to engage residents in long-term, wider, broader <laughs> efforts to uh, organize and operate a, a resilience coordinating network and build population level capacity for mental, mental, mental wellness and transformation resilience. Uh, and this really, uh, by doing this, engaging residents in this way and engaging them in identifying existing strengths and resources or assets and adding additional protective factors, that you'll find is far more effective than identifying and treating, uh, trying to eliminate uh, risk in the community or fix deficits or treat symptoms of mental health problems. All of that will remain important, but really building those protective factors is keys. So, I now want to just sort of talk about what we're going to do from this point forward. And I'm going to start again with an analogy 
uh, if you will, of the value of a public health approach to mental wellness and resilience. And this to think about, this is an analogy, but it's actually very accurate. Uh, in the 19th century, strategies to prevent disease by prioritizing cleaning up sewer systems and water systems turned out to be far more effective than all the treatments that doctors and medical facilities provided uh, to address the illnesses and diseases that result. That is to say, they folk, that's a public health approach, not just treating individuals who were sick, but in fact, trying to address the causes of the problem by treating them uh, uh, in, in dealing with them issues. And we know that social isolation and loneliness caused by the kinds of jobs people have or loss of jobs, loss of income, uh, uh, social, the social media uh, that's really gotten out of control and other factors has called many types of mental health and psychosocial problems today. Uh, so today we're gonna begin by examining the social sewer system, to, to use that term, if you will, mm -hmm. that is causing these mental health and psychosocial problems. And we're gonna focus on how to clean it up clean up that sewer system, just like we did in the 19th century. Hope this analogy isn't going too far. Um, <laughs> next week, we're going to focus on how to prevent and heal the mental health problems generated by another part of our sewer system, so to speak, our mental health sewer system. And that is unsafe, unhealthy, and unjust physical built conditions, transportation, housing, uh, parks, et cetera, economic conditions, jobs, uh, et cetera, and ecological conditions, local air and water quality, forest, et cetera. So today's agenda, uh, we're gonna focus on the first foundational area that our research determined a number of years back was really gonna be vital to build population level mental wellness and transformational resilience for the climate emergency. And that is to build social connections across geographic, economic, and cultural boundaries in the community. And we are very honored, I'm very honored to have presenters that really are gr great presenters from two really outstanding initiatives. Howard Lawrence, who's the coordinator of Abundant Community Edmonton in Edmonton, Canada, and Robert Sanger, who's the founding director of Peace for Tarpon, the first uh, trauma-informed community in the US, Tarpon Springs, Florida. And we'll hear from both of those people in a second. First, I wanna just, uh, Take a moment to practice a resilience pause. But this time we're going to sort of move. We've been focusing on breath-based and body-based kind of skills. This time we're going to move to a sort of a cognitive skill, and it's called the control test. And it's a really helpful method of self-care. And it's a mixture of the Buddhist and Stoicism. And Stoicism, by the way, does not mean, you know, a stiff upper lip or anything. It's an, an ancient Greek philosophy of how to live life that's very linked with, very uh, similar to Buddhism. And what it says is that before you worry about something or while you're worried about it, or before you take any kind of action, if you can, always try to run through, through a basic test to see what you can and cannot control about what you're worrying about, about what you might want to take action about, and then focus on only what you can control. The only things when you actually think about it that you can control are your character, how you see the world and lead your life, your actions and reactions to things, and how you treat others. That's really the only thing you can control, those factors. And so things we can control include our opinions, what we pursue, our desires, our aversions, the words we use, our reactions to things, our behaviors, and things that we can't control. They're not in our control. What others say to us, what others do, how others think about us, um, uh, the, prop, the value of your property, the value of your money, uh, all those things we can try to uh, manage as best as we can, but we really can't totally control those things. Um, so, um, Let's practice the, uh, uh, this one here. Yeah. So let's just practice the control test now for just a second. If you're willing, and only if you want to do this, just like all the resilience pauses we have, it's only if you're willing. Um, try to identify something right now that you're worrying about or that you're anxious about. Take a second and do that. 
and you worry about something that's going to happen today, worrying about something that happened in your home or in your job yesterday, or anxious about something. Now ask yourself if that is something within your control related to your character, who you are, your actions or reactions to things, or how you treat other people. Is it, is it something within your control? And if it's not related to one of those factors, then it's obviously not really within your control. Uh, if the answer is yes, what you're worrying about is in your control, then you can take action to try to address it. If it is not within your control, do not harm yourself with what is called a second arrow. And what that means is, uh, this is a Buddhist term, but it's also used in uh, many other uh, uh, forms of, of thinking about these issues, that you you are harmed by what some, or you are affected by what somebody might have said to you or something that happened in your life. But then you get hit with a second arrow that you shoot yourself with that creates all sorts of distress where you become distressed and anxious, uh, worrying, et cetera, uh, about it. So there, that second arrow is usually the most powerful one. Uh, and it's the one you can control. We can't control the adversities that happen in our life for the most part. They're gonna, the adversities just do happen. What we can control is that second arrow that we shoot into ourselves, so to speak, and cause more pain by worrying about it, become anxious, depressed, et cetera. So after you use, after you decide if it's in your control or not, uh, and if it's not, try to not shoot a second arrow into you, then you can try to uh, decide if making the choice, it, it use the skylight method to sort of see if making that choice made a difference in how, how you think and fear and observe what you experience. So just take a second and do that. Is this within your control, whatever you are worrying about or anxious about? Uh, was it related to your character, your actions or reactions, how you treat others? And if it is, try to do something about it if you want to. But if it's not, don't harm yourself more by continuing to worry or be anxious because you're just shooting that second arrow into you. And once you realize that, Use the skylight method or whatever method you want to sort of see, does that make a difference to how you feel, your body, mind, and emotions? So how does this relate to the climate ecosystem biodiversity catastrophe? That control test can empower you to be a person of action. You can get educated, get trained, uh, build alliances, continually press for economic, social, political changes, et cetera. But focusing, but but because by focusing only on what you can control, which is yourself, you can put your energy where you can create the most meaningful change and avoid the second arrow and therefore maintain your own personal wellness and resilience. In short, the control test makes decision making and emotional investment easier to manage. It allows us not to be stressed out about things we can't control. And this can be very liber liberating. It is really a really powerful self-help tool. And we'll, we'll come back to that later, but I just want to share this with you now to get you thinking about it. So with that, let's do a 10 minute breakout room uh, just to uh, get together, get together with a few folks, just if you would, in one word, share how you're feeling right now. And then just discuss what stood out for you from last week's presentation by Matt Irv and uh, Graham Parker about different ways to help residents begin to heal their traumas and who you shared that information with and the outcomes of your discussions about organizing a way for local residents to begin to heal their trauma. Jesse will divide you up into breakout groups and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thanks. Well, welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you had a good uh, discussions. And if you're uh, willing, if uh, somebody who is part of your group can post in chat any particular issues that, that uh, came up, uh, 
questions that came up, et cetera, we'll try to get to them. Christian will try to track them and we'll try to get to them by the end of the, the session. So just again, to uh, reiterate now, um, the, the first week we talked about how to get organized and form a resilience coordinating network. Now, last week we talked about how to uh, begin building community capacity with a couple of different options. Um, and this session, we're gonna talk about how to build social connections, one of those five core areas. And the next, after these next five sessions, the last two sessions, we'll talk about how to continually learn and grow and improve. And so the, there is five areas that we'll talk about to build that are really gonna be vital to build universal capacity for mental wellness and transformation resilience. Uh, again, we're just gonna focus today on building social connections, but they're all interconnected. Uh, so we're gonna go through them linearly, but in fact, they're interconnected. Um, so just before we get into this and, and hear from Howard, um, uh, let me just ask you to ask yourself, when do you feel happiest, most fulfilled and peaceful? Just try to figure that out and just put a comment in chat. It's when I'm doing X or when I am whatever. When do you feel most happiest, most peaceful, most fulfilled? And then think about it. When, how much of your happiness and fulfillment and peacefulness depends on your connections to others? And put that in chat. Any awareness of that? How much is the, your connections with other people really shapes your happiness, fulfillment, peacefulness? Research shows that loneliness and social isolation can produce anxiety, depression, PTSD, increased suicidality, and more. And lack of social connections and loneliness can lead to the loss of self-worth, loss of meaning and purpose in life. And these are essential human needs. But it goes beyond that. Loneliness also inhibits the immune system. It promotes inflammation, aggravates the stress response. And so it's twice as harmful to both mental and physical health as things like obesity and increased risk of premature mortality. So it's a pretty... Uh, impactful issue. Um, and uh, at the, the flip side is also possible that people who feel connected to others have lower rates of anxiety and depression. The research is very clear about that. And they also have higher self-esteem and higher empathy for others. And people with good social connections tend to be more trusting, cooperative, which creates a feedback loop that makes others more trusting and cooperative with them. So they have better relationships. In other words, social connections generate a positive feedback loop that enhances social, physical, emotional, and physical wellness. But in our society today, or almost all countries, our social connections are really fragmented and um, uh, vast social isolation and loneliness. But social connections are also vital for the climate ecosystem biodiversity crisis as we've already talked about for the first five days or more of most disasters or many disasters, survival largely depends on your friends, family, and neighbors, not emergency responders. Um, social connections are key to, to helping people move to safe spaces and obtaining food, water, shelter, and other basic needs. And they're key to providing the sense of safety and emotional support needed during and after extreme stresses and disasters. So just one example, research in the Pacific Northwest record heat wave we had out here about two, three years ago, found that the people who were socially isolated were much more apt to die than those who had connections. And the same dynamic applies to many other disasters. And this is why building social connections is by far the most important foundational area resilience coordinating networks should focus on to build population level mental wellness and resilience. And all activities should build social connections, all the activities we're involved with. Um, it should be a standalone focus to do this. And we're gonna hear this from uh, the two speakers uh, how to do that, but, it, but building social connections should also be a central focus of each of the other four foundational areas that we're gonna talk about over the next four weeks. And there's three, one way to think about social connections is there's three interconnected types that resilience coordinating networks to focus on. Bonding social support networks called strong ties, our friends, families, and close neighbors, people you share your life with 
you share intimate details of your life with. But there's bridging social support networks. Also, they're called weak ties. They are your connections, your, your bonding social support networks connection with another bonding network. But you don't share your personal life, your intimate details of your life with these folks who just know them real well. You might get together occasionally, et cetera. That's why they're called weak ties. You don't share that. And then there's linking social support networks, which are also weak ties. These are links between bonding and bridging social support networks and people or organizations in your community who have economic resources or political power who help you uh, in the midst of adversities, et cetera. So, and, and getting them all connected. Um, so with that as a background, I'd like to introduce Howard Lawrence, uh, who is the coordinator of Abundant Community Edmonton in the city of Edmonton, Canada, and is doing wonderful work in this area. Uh, and Howard, thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to you. Is Howard there somewhere? Yeah, Bob, in case he doesn't speak up, and Howard, if you are on, please feel free to cut me off. I do not see Howard, um, but... <laughs> I do see Robin. Robin, why don't we hang on a second? I'll just. I'm going to switch gears and we're going to introduce Robin Sanger, who's the founding director of Peace for Tarpon in Tarpon Springs, Florida. And uh, Robin's on the ITRC National Steering Committee. So, Robin, um, uh, take it away. Thank you. Robin, are you on mute? Yeah. Yes, I was. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's hard to it's hard to have any kind of connection if you're muted. You know, <laughs> big picture, small picture. You got to speak up, show up, and speak up at some point. <laughs> so, uh, Bob, I read your list of of the points you wanted me to address, and I'll try to try to get them all. But this <clears throat> here in in the little group I was in. <clears throat> it became very evident that the power of, of small group connections, of, of real conversations, and how that can instantly link us. Uh, Peace for Tarpon began about, actually, we just had our 14th anniversary. And uh, when Peace for Tarpon began, um, I was an elected official. I was the vice mayor of our town, Tarpon Springs. Before that, I'd had a long career and still do as an artist. I opened my studio here in 1985. So the leap from politics, from art into politics was huge. But when I got into politics, I was fascinated with seeing a disconnect between all the social services and the people, the, the financial supports that were in our county, which is a very, has a lot of assets, Pinellas County, Florida. And pondering why there was a disconnect between all these efforts, everyone doing, pedaling as fast as they could, doing all this work, why the numbers kept going up of child abuse, domestic violence, you know, that more and more uh, things that we see out in the world, you know, unhoused people and on and on. And I was pondering that, trying to figure out what are we missing? What are we missing? And that's when I learned about the ACE study um, and learned about how unaddressed childhood trauma plays out in the course of a life. And I became, uh, I became a, a born again. I became the person that, that people would walk away from at cocktail parties because I was that person who would come up and just start talking about trauma and uh, ACEs and all this. But it really... I wanted to take it a step farther. So I thought, here we are as a community. What if our city had this lens and understood that behavior doesn't come out of nowhere, that things are not just unpredictable and, and anything can happen at any time, that it's a very rational world if you look at the root causes of what drives behavior, it makes sense. And it makes so much sense, I thought, that what if our city became a partner in this as a community initiative to bring this knowledge, this understanding and implementing it in our little town of, well, then it was 27,000 people, which sounds like a little town, but 27,000 people uh, coming and going and having their own lives to, to lead, getting them engaged was, um, and still is a very full-time 
focus of Peace for TARP and the social connection of building real relationships and so forth. So we happened to begin when our Rotary Club was hosting a community day on domestic violence. And I, you know, it's interesting enough, but I thought, well, what if instead we kind of pivoted and did this toward looking towards a trauma-informed community? So basically, I, I guess I strong-armed the, the Rot Rotarian that I knew. And I said, you know, Ron, what if, can we do this and just talk about trauma instead and talk about ACEs and talk about this and I'll find us a speaker? And he didn't know what he was agreeing to. I know, I didn't know what I was asking of him, but he said, sure. So we ended up in a in our uh, one of our churches in the big auditorium. We had about 200 people there and I invited Tony or Kane down. And I'm sure y'all, some of you are familiar with Tony or Kane and Healing Neen, uh, the video that she has. She's a wonderful speaker, very powerful, very powerful presence. So we invited her. And at that point we asked the community to engage as they, as they wished to kind of sign on to be part of this effort, which we didn't know what we were asking them to sign on to. We, we were basically figuring it out as we went along because there were no models. There were, we were emerging. We were an emerging model that now is much more prevalent, but at the time we didn't know what we were doing basically. And from that one meeting, we had a several committees form and kind of start our work began. But one thing that I wanna share with you because I know time is a little short is one of our teams was a marketing team and the marketing team came up with uh, a poster that we created that was just lines of what this community initiative means. I believe it's on our website, might be on our Facebook page, but it was lines like, have real conversations. You are not alone, build trust. And, you know, simple things like that that kind of give the feeling of what we were trying to do without talking trauma this, trauma that, because I already knew that that was a real turnoff for, for people, understandably so. They're they're experiencing their own stuff and let, let me put it right in their face, right? So one of the strongest things that came out of that was offer the peace you can. That became our tagline, offer the peace, P-I-E-C-E dash P-E-A-C-E, you can. And the idea is that everyone has a unique piece to offer to the solution, not a unique idea, but a very powerful idea if you put it to the community. So when people come to us and want to volunteer um, and they say, "What we, I want to do something, I want to get involved with Peace for Tarpon. Well, what are you passionate about? What are you interested in doing? What is your, let's, let's, let's get to know each other before I you know, give you tasks to fulfill. So a lot of this work is extremely modest, small scale. It's having, meeting people over coffee, getting to know people, maintaining those relationships. And that in and of itself is a full-time job. The, it became apparent early on that the community partners were our strength because the uh, agencies, the service providers and agencies, they could be there for several months, be wonderful participants, really help, help, help. And then all of a sudden they were gone because they accepted a position in another part of the county or they moved or this and that. The people who stay here in our little town are multi-generational. And that's really what we're looking at doing is doing transform transformational uh, transformation to the entire community to address these, these generational traumas and how can we get around them? So how I describe it to people is most solutions are pulling people out of the river as fast as you can. People that are drowning, being pulled out of the river, and more, you, you can't do it fast enough. More people need help all the time. We're going upstream. We're saying, why are they going in to begin with and what can we do about that? And whether it is a, a modest thing, one of our social connectors that's very powerful, but very small and modest. It's like, it doesn't have to be a 200 person thing, you know, then you have to manage those 200 people and figure out how to engage all those partners. Small is good. Small is really good. One of the things that came out, uh, a piece that one of our folks offered was he wanted to do something. He's a member of the Baha'i faith. The Baha'is don't drink. This was during COVID and everyone was having these happy hours. And he said, well, I don't, I don't drink, but I could have tea. He said, I'd like to have a tea for people who are isolated and we can just talk about positive things. So he found this list of virtues 
And people would come to this once a month tea for an hour on a Wednesday from 12 to one. It wasn't this big, long thing. And would discuss a virtue. Each one would, you know, different person would host it each month and discuss a virtue, what that meant to them, this and that. But these positive conversations that left people were leaving uplifted um, and feeling connection. And what was very interesting about this, so COVID was an isolating event, but the people in the group, interestingly enough, and the ones that are that now we're going on three years with this, I guess, the people, some of them are socially isolated. Some of them are due to uh, health issues or are constrained. One of the partners, one of the participants has MS and is in a chair. And so she's very socially isolated people who don't have transportation, someone else had suffered a stroke and could no longer get out and about. So what the unintended uh, outcome of this was bringing in members of the, of the very isolated communities, but also bringing in the disability community, which is very overlooked quite often because they're, they're not out and about and in public and they're isolated. So that's just um, food for thought of how can you include even beyond just people you don't know and you get to know them and become friends and establish trust. What about the people who aren't even on the radar, who are isolated for different reasons? They are also experiencing the same loneliness and disconnect that other people are as well. Um, so the Peace for Tarpon, one day, one of our partners came up and said, I know what the four in Peace for Tarpon stands for. I'd never, we'd never thought about that. Peace for Tarpon. It's connect, inform, transform, and heal. Connection is for, foremost. We have to have connections before we can do anything else. Once we establish connections in the form of real relationships, not just like, oh, I know that person, I know this person, real, real stuff. Um, then we can share information, we can have transformational experiences, and healing can happen. But healing happens not in isolation. Healing happens, Boz, Bob knows very well, community is medicine. Healing happens in community. So the work is very, very slow um, as far as results. We're an all-volunteer, unfunded organization, and not an organization, an initiative. And over the years, many organizations have wanted to help us out by taking us over to turn the, turn us into something better, <laughs> which means something funded and something with staff. That's not what we're about. So part of, of the caution of a trauma-informed community is understanding that everything goes towards the well-worn grooves. If there's a way, you know, it's like, okay, I want to start something. What's the first thing we need? Well, we need a mission statement, and then we need a you know, all those types of things. That can be a real sticking point as well. Think of your big goals, what you want to do, the mission statement, your vision statement, and all those are, are important. But what are you really trying to do? Um, and what do you really need to do that? Do you need a building? Do you need staff? Do you need, you know, I mean, so, some, some do and some don't. But things tend to go towards the well-worn group. So even though we were working to establish something very, very different and unique and new, and we were experiencing that as it emerged, we also felt that, how do I wanna say this? That by partnering with other agencies, large and more powerful agencies, funding agencies and so forth, what look what appeared to be happening was they kind of wanted to own us. It's like, we'll take it from here. You did a good job, kid. We'll take it from here. And that's the well-worn grooves I'm talking about. Nothing wrong with having an organization. You kind of have to have some structure and some form to be in this world. It can't just be an amorphous feeling of love or whatever, although that would be nice. But how do we establish something real that doesn't fall into the same patterns. And so that that's a, an interesting, interesting food for thought. So I caution, that's a caution as well, because we, we, we had some pretty active uh, bloodless coups as far as people saying, oh, we can help you out. And then we, you know, decide who you're gonna be and everything you do support who you want that to be. Your community is your power. Your community is your is the true energy of your group. They're the ones that are gonna be with you and they're the ones that get this. Um, it's not a difficult thing to understand trauma. 
bringing the, the, the piece of resilience into this didn't happen for several years. That was not part of the lexicon in the first maybe five or six years. It was only trauma, 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 trauma. Then someone went, Bing, what about resilience? So we realized an even a deeper resource, a deeper well for us to draw from is to, how do we create a resilient community? Well, obviously this connection does help create resiliency. What are symbols of resiliency in our community? We're about to have our first peace poll as a symbol of resiliency and connection in our community. That's a big deal for us. It only took two years. Another thing is don't be in a hurry because everything takes a lot longer than you think it is. Uh, peace for Tarpon encouraged the city commission to make the red mangrove, which is on my shirt here. I don't know if you can see it. One of our partners um, created this image for us. The red mangrove is a symbol of resilience in our community. It's an amazing tree. It transforms toxic salt water into fresh water in its root system. It's a source for all of our Gulf life, for the you know, sponge and shrimp and everything else. Commercial and sport fishermen have much better success if you have a, a lot of mangroves. We have the most shoreline of any of any city in our county. We have mangroves all over the place. So it's a thing, people can look at that and say the mangrove is a resilient tree. We're a resilient community. We're supporting this, this transformation of toxicity into fresh water, basically. And that, that this tree is a symbol of ours. Um, someone suggested to put them, put this little logo on houses. So we're about to start a committee to either do painting or decals on houses or businesses, just to get into people's minds. Here, this is us, we're resilient, look at this, you know, and something that we can all be proud of. Work in progress, uh, 14 years in, it's endlessly fascinating, but there's an endless, trust the direction things are going. If doors aren't open for you, don't keep knocking at that door. There's a million things to do with this, maybe a million and one. Go to the open doors, go to where your support systems are, because the energy that's carrying this initiative is bigger than us as individuals. I guarantee you that. This is work that is meant to happen at this time. We need it to help our world survive, to help us as, as humanity survive and thrive. We need this now. So go towards the open doors and follow the energy. Let the energy go in the direction. You will have the most, as my friend, my good friend Garth Brooks said, if you take a step in any direction towards what you want, the impossible suddenly becomes possible. And that has proven to be true over and over and over again. I can give you long stories of what started out as this that turned into this and now it's this and da da da. You don't know how rich something can be and how it can evolve unless you give it a chance to express itself. As an artist, and I'm sure some of y'all are artists, I saw several comments about art being one of your resiliency sources. It's not that we're the artist, we're, we're like, we're gonna create this. If something comes through us and it, it appears in the world that wasn't there before, it's not what I expect when I create art. I don't know what it's gonna be, but it never fails me. You know, there, there's an endless amount of creative solutions in the world. Be one of those. Support those. And I guess I'll call that the end of my little talk, Bob. How's that? Perfect. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin. And uh, I've always been so inspired by your work. And um, uh, this is great. Let's, if it's okay with you now, let's take some questions. And that we saw a lot of them popping up in chat. Uh, if you, uh, we were going to have you and uh, Howard speak about it, but let's just have you speak about it. And after you're done, I, I still don't see Howard, so I'll just do a very brief overview of what of Howard's initiative. But um, so, Christian, can you read any questions that have uh, appeared, uh, and Robin can respond? Yes. Initially, we had a question regarding a speaker that was mentioned early in this uh, time of sharing. I believe it was the person who had facilitated a tea time. Um, to provide support to the community. Do you recall what uh, the name of the speaker was? Uh, this, the speaker might have been the one at the initial community event, and her yeah. name is Tonier, T-O-N-I-E-R, Kane, Tonier Kane. She has a video called Healing Neen, N-E-E-N, that's her nickname. Brilliant video of, of, of her transformation of becoming, you know, becoming a, she's a, a, a all the unfortunate things you can put in someone's life, that was hers for many years. Lived under a bridge, blah, blah, blah. 
now she's an internationally known speaker and is doing amazingly, but she shares her story beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. So how have you maintained energy and your efforts throughout the years with all these, from all volunteers? <clears throat> the, our volunteers are, people love this work. If people, if people see that they can be, take an active role or take a role, a meaningful role, we'll call it a meaningful role in transforming beyond their own lives, their community, it's a very magnetic thing. Um, it, it, it's more managing the people who come forward. So this past week, we've had, I don't know, five or six new community residents join. All those, someone, you know, you have to have coffee with them. You have to share with them. You have to see how they want to contribute, hear their stories. All that stuff just takes a lot, a lot, a lot of time. But it's endlessly fascinating and it's energizing. So it, it keeping the support, yeah, we're, we're a very... We're a very internally motivated collective. Thank you. Other questions? So at a, at a given time, how many people are volunteering with you? How many groups or committees are running on average? Well, we just were actually, there's a company called Bivara, B-E-V-A-R-A. -E they do consulting for nonprofits, brilliant company. And they heard about us and offered us uh, a year pro bono consulting for a strategic plan, a three-year strategic plan, a secession plan, and basically a roadmap for our future, which we've needed. It came, like I said, it, it appeared. It's like, it's time for us to really look at this. I have other things I want to do besides, you know, I love having coffee with people. <laughs> I have other things I want to accomplish too and, and do for joy and pleasure and lo love and all that. So, um, yeah. But that that just kind of came up. So now we're looking at something more. So we're 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 going to be having an advancement committee. We have an education team, and the two strongest ones are marketing and education. They've existed since day one, and uh, you know a lot of the folks. It's like we have a memorandum of understanding, a memorandum of understanding that's on our homepage of our website, which is also being updated because someone just said you're volunteered your website could use some updating it's like yeah and so they volunteered pro bono their time pro bono and in kind we got a great a huge grant was huge to us from robert wood johnson about five years in because they said we like what you're doing with no money let's see what you do with some money and it was overwhelming to have money but we had a lot of fun spending it we put up put it back into community and um but we kept this people's ability to donate their time, their, their talent, that as well, besides just financial contributions, which are also important. I don't think I answered that question at all, but there you Good go. Good enough. Let, let me ask another question very quickly that relates. I know that were some spinoffs from Peace to Tarp and Peace for other communities. Uh, can you sort of share that and how that happened? Sure. So Peace for Tarpon, um, one day we have monthly meetings and uh, these folks from Gainesville showed up. The River Phoenix Center for Peace Building, uh, Hart Phoenix and her husband, Jeffrey, one of their police officers, a city commissioner, uh, just some a group of people from Gainesville just showed up and they said, we want to be peace for Gainesville. And we went, OK. So we kind of mentored them. And then uh, Crawford County, Pennsylvania, actually it started out as Meadville, Pennsylvania, but they wanted another city included. So it's Crawford County, Pennsylvania, it became Peace for Crawford County. There's Peace for Minnesota here in Florida, which is three counties south of Pinellas County. Peace for the Big Bend, which is six counties in the Panhandle. There's Sarasota Strong. They don't all have to be Peace for communities. So we helped launch Sarasota Strong. Uh, Paces, Hillsboro. Um, basically, we will will support. And any of you guys, if you're interested in in a in a, a niche or there's some something you're fascinated with, I'm happy to share my contact information. We can have a phone call, a Zoom call, and I'll share with you anything that might be help that I you know that you might find helpful to support you in your work as you as you move forward with this. There's Holding Strong in GL11, which is in the UK, Gloucestershire. 
And that was a surprise, but people all over the world have been kind of following us and every now and then they reach out. But yeah, there's there's many other community models that are emerging. They don't all start from the same place. They all emerge differently. Ours came out of my position as city hall as an elected official, but also my creative side as an artist. So it'll, you know, it comes from where it comes from. Right. Thank you. And and that's what's so what like you said, Robin, that you start off and you just never know where this is going to lead. You know, it it's just fun. It's all fun. over the world, you know. Yeah. So, it's it's well, yeah. it's so endlessly I mean, fun. I don't mean to sound light about trauma and all this, sure. but it's it it's for me as a creative person, I I thrive on this because this is the biggest creativity you can do. How to transform a community is bigger than a public art project. It's a community initiative. It's it's like how can we have three or four generations from now be different? But as far as as monitoring our numbers and all that, we don't have staff to do that. We don't have a date. We don't have data keepers. We get interns every now and then. Now we do have the ACE questionnaire on our website, and that's linked to another one of those stories that sounded that started from one of our board members saying, "I I figured out the piece I want to offer," and that just turned into ten more steps to where now we have a relationship with the University of Florida with the School of Public Health Communications and the master's level class School of Public Health. So Peace for Tarpon was their subject for two semesters. We went up and le did, gave lectures and tape interviews and all kinds of things. And they offered to keep the data for our ACE questionnaire in their big room with one of those computers with the big wheels that goes around and around. and. Um, we had one of their interns who's very interested in data quantified all that data. So we had, and this was over uh, maybe a year and a half ago, we had 60,000 responses to our ACE questionnaire online. He went through, found out, you know, made sure there were no duplicate addresses, ones that were duplicate filled out that were incomplete, got rid of all of those. And we ended up with 39,000 solid, solid pieces of evidence that he went and figured out, you know, all the the charts and everything about who responded. Fascinating. The data was pretty much reflected what the uh, original ACE questionnaire did, which was pretty interesting. But if you go on our website, you can be part of that and be number whatever number <laughs> whatever number it is now. So what the purpose of that is, I don't know. But we have a really great amount of data. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think we don't have any more time, but what we'd like to do is uh, we are still getting questions in chat. We will send them to you after that, after this, and you and I can just work out how to respond to them and we can send them back out to everybody if that works out okay. It works for me. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Robin, so much for your Thank taking you the time to, Thank you. Uh, to join us. And, and thanks for all the wonderful work you do. Yes, you. absolutely. And you guys don't be shy. If you want to talk, call me. Okay. Yeah, and we'll send everybody your contact information so you'll okay. get it. Okay. Bye bye. I'm going to leave now. Okay. Take care. Y'all take care. Bye bye. All right. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about, about Howard Lawrence's thing, and then we're going to do a breakout room. Um, the, the Abundant Community Edmonton, I don't know what happened to Howard. Uh, we just actually were on the line last week on a different issue. So somehow something happened. But what they have done is they realized that they need to make uh, connections of, uh, in neighborhoods across the community. So they've organized a program where they recruit and then train what they call block connectors. One person for every two or three blocks in the community. They train them in how to interview people on their block, in their neighborhood, uh, and meet them and talk to them, et cetera. And those block connectors go around and knock on every door on their in their neighborhood they interview the people what are your concerns what are you interested in what do you like to do etc they put that information into a database and they send it out to everybody in the neighborhood and into the community and what happens is that people who like to do, do dog walking at six in the morning find out that oh two blocks away there's two other people that like that and they start walking dogs together in the morning people who like woodworking find out that you know there's somebody else that's doing woodworking and they start doing woodworking together and it begins to build that community connection. And then they have 
that's overseen. So it's done very well by a board, uh, a steering committee, basically a resilience coordinating network, as we call it. Uh, and it's been a very powerful uh, a process. I've never seen any other community doing that kind of work. Um, and uh, even during COVID, then they did some research, what are the effects? And the, they find that people found that incredibly helpful um, given the isolation that people experience. And so there's another model, just get on their website, go Abundant Community Edmonton, and you'll, you'll find more information about that. Sorry, Howard couldn't make it to share more detail about it. So let's just take a very brief resilience pause and practice the control test. If you would identify something you're worrying about or anxious about, and then ask if that's within your control. Meaning, is it related to your character, who you are, how you think about the world, your actions or reactions to things, and how you treat others? Or is it something not in your control? And if the answer is yes, you can act on that. You can, it's within your control. And if it's not, if it's not within your control, if, because it's not part of your character, your actions or reactions or how you treat others, don't harm yourself by creating emotional, psychological pain or what we call the second arrow. And then after you sort of use that process, think that through, you might want to, if, if it makes sense to you, use the skylight method, observe yourself. How, does, how do you feel? What's happening in your body, mind, and emotions? When you realize that many of the things you're worrying about, you can't control or that you're anxious about, it doesn't have to do with your character, your actions and reactions, or how you treat others. And let it go and realize you do the best you can. So with that, um, we're going to go here. See. All right. Let's do breakout rooms now for 10 minutes uh, and just share what you learned from Robin. And if you heard a little bit about Howard's presentation, anything that stood out for you and how could you simil implement similar approaches uh, to build social connections in your neighborhood and community and then identify any key questions that your group comes up with. So Jesse's going to divide you up now and we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had some good conversations. Uh, if any of you can uh, are willing to share something that came up um, in your uh, conversations, uh, put it in chat, key questions, key issues. Um, and if anybody uh, ha has a, is involved with a program in your community that specifically focuses on building social connections deliberately, can you share that in chat? Uh, and Christian, can you just sort of read a couple of questions that uh, might have come up in chat as people from the Q&A, if people get a chance to uh, post there? And if they're not any, I can we can talk about a couple other things and then uh, we can wait for the questions to come in. Is there anything you see, Christian, there? Yes, excellent. So we have a question coming in about how to speak about vulnerability, grief, fear, despair, or anger with people who fear vulnerability or speaking about emotions? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the, I'm going to, I'll respond first, but then if anybody else has a thought about that, post that in chat. Uh, and uh, Christian can read a few of those out there um, that, that come in. But uh, I think, again, the, the key to talking about the issues is first, about any issues, is first to connect with the people that you're trying to communicate with. Find out exactly what they, how they see the world and what they're concerned about, and then share what's going on within you that might be similar. Um, and that often is sort of gets beyond concerns about terms, and you're just talking about your own personal sense that, oh, boy, I've been distressed too, you know, uh, out here I'm talking personally by myself. Uh, we just had this uh, a historic ice storm that's really caused a lot of damage and people are all concerned, et cetera. So you just sort of share yourself 
and try to connect with people on that. Uh, and then uh, often that will lead to more honest conversations about work, uh, issues that uh, won't, uh, don't get tied up in, uh, uh, in terms. But I think uh, just always be aware that people are often afraid of or ashamed of sh sharing the fact that they might be very distressed or they're having problems or that they are, you know, uh, using a coping mechanism, alcohol or drugs that isn't very healthy and they know it. People are sh often ashamed of that, embarrassed, and so they don't want to talk about that. So you could just talk about things that, uh, rather than asking someone to share all that uh, in, until and unless they're ready, just asking, uh, uh, talking about how people uh, and how you and others you know deal with adversities and deal with stresses and give some examples and say, boy, I saw my friend, you know, Sally, she really, she got together with friends and they went walking and it just, boy, she just started feeling really good. So that's just one way to do that. Christian, anything else pop in there? Any other comments that anybody wants to make about that question? Yeah, we have some great additions here. Um, we have a participant saying through listening, Another person saying, I think modeling safe enough vulnerability often supports others in being vulnerable. Um, uh, a participant saying, I will often lead with my own vulnerability and that'll inspire others to share. So some great suggestions here. And if we have any other questions, please feel free to post them in chat here. Any other comments, okay. right? Yeah. Excellent. And then we do have another question. Um, sometimes grant funding can keep community partners from getting involved in the RCN for various reasons. How can we break down those barriers? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, we were just talking about this, the, the, the three of us uh, during the breakout room, that one way to think about it is community-led versus community-based. Both are important. Um, community-based uh, means, uh, in this term, a nonprofit or a government agency has funding or gets funding. And because they're responsible for the funding, they have to meet certain goals that they've told the funders, certain objectives, et cetera, certain go uh, ends. Um, and so they are the ultimate decision makers. They often then go out and engage community members in the activities that they said they were gonna do. But the, the community knows that they're not the ultimate decision makers. It's the nonprofit or the government agency because they have these higher up, and this is what Robin was sort of sharing, uh, they, these, these other goals they have to meet. Uh, and so when the funding ends, uh, or when people are organizations are competing for funding, it actually can create even uh, just as many problems that. But when the funding ends, the initiative often ends because the community has not owned it. It's owned or run by the nonprofit or the government agency. Community led is very different. It's a very it is what Robin and Peace for Tarpon and these other initiatives are doing, that the community itself makes the decisions about what it is doing. Uh, so there's no uh, uh, other entity that, this, that is the ultimate decision makers. And when funding ends or when funding comes in, it doesn't really change what people are doing. Uh, or, uh, and it, it helps people continue to have ownership for how the initiative uh, uh, operates. And that's really, really important. Uh, so uh, even in the Community Mental Wellness and Resilience Act, the federal bill that we've been working on, uh, the way a community gets funding is that a nonprofit has to be designated by a, a diverse, wide diverse group of individuals and nonprofits as their fiscal sponsor to get a grant through the, the grant program that the, the federal initiative will operate. They are not running the program. They're just the fiscal sponsor. And it's this broad steering committee that actually runs the program. Uh, and that often... Then, then that then different organizations can talk with the, the steering committee or whatever you want to call it, and they the steering committee decides who is the likely best nonprofit or organization to serve as our fiscal sponsor. Um, so I hope that answers part of the questions. Uh, uh, one more question, Christian. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to post them in chat. Or if um, we have any follow-up questions for Robin or the community of practice in general, feel free to send them to me via email. I'll post that in the chat too. Right. Okay. Let's let's go on then. So I want to talk about a few other things, and then we'll wrap up for the day. Uh, also, I want to talk about physical resilience hubs. Um, these can be a helpful resource for certain people. 
Uh, they're often thought of as a place where people can connect and they can be the physical hubs can be helpful uh, when they are trusted by local residents uh, because they can provide people with uh, support by connecting with others, information, key resources during, before, and after disasters. And a hub can be a library, a community center, a business, a religious facility. Even I've seen private homes. Seattle has designated different homes in neighborhoods. People volunteer to, they'll be a hub. Uh, so people can go there, try to get information from them, et cetera. And I, even in, back, in Victoria, BC, uh, the uh, Neighborhood Resilience Group has designated a park bench of all places as a hub. And what they mean by that is underneath the bench in a locked facility are cell phone chargers, uh, are lists of all the people who live in the community with their addresses and phone numbers and information about them. So people can check in. If there's a big disaster, they go to the park bench in a, in a, in a park. Uh, they say, oh, we don't know about Sally. She's uh, 84. Uh, and she's over there. Can somebody go check on her, et cetera? They're very, very helpful in that way. Um, and I, again, during disasters, a hub can be a central gathering point to check in on others, assess impacts, et cetera, uh, gather information. But physical hubs are usually not for everyone. That is a quote from Christian Baja, who's with the uh, uh, Urban Sustainable Directors Network who really has led the effort, one of the groups that led the efforts on developing hubs. Uh, they're most helpful for populations that don't have other resources or options to go to. Uh, and generally only people living nearby who have the ability to easily access the physical facility and trust with the people who are in charge of it and who are likely to use it, only they will go there. Uh, and in addition, a physical facility might be damaged or inaccessible uh, itself in a disaster. That just happened where I live in Oregon, where this huge ice storm, there was nobody that was going to go to a physical facility. There wasn't any power anyway for any of them, but you just couldn't get around. So the real key is the what well, we've talked about, the horizontal social infrastructure in communities. Those social connections is really key. And if a physical hub helps with that. It can be very helpful. Uh, uh, if not, it might not be. Uh, but again, it's likely going to be more helpful for specific populations. For example, in wildfires out here in Oregon, uh, we had tremendous uh, hazardous smoke events, low-income populations, indigenous people, BIPOC residents didn't have air cleaners and air conditioners. So uh, a bill was passed to create a resilience hub where they could go uh, people that were affected that didn't have those resources could go and get in clean air, clean water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Very helpful for that kind of thing. But be, but just be uh, note noteworthy about what uh, a hub can do. Um, and can I think we just got to one of the sort of connection questions we just had? Can building social connections deal with today's uh, polarized conditions? Can we do that? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, it's not easy, but when you take the time to talk about people to people about practical issues, share who you are yourself, uh, and talk about practical ways to address them in ways that benefits everyone, positive connections can can, can develop, and it takes time, as as Robin said. Um, so, creating a non-judgmental, <clears throat> welcoming environment, practicing your own self-regulation and, and co-regulation skills that control. Uh, practice, if we talked about, uh, and helping everyone develop a strong sense of safety and support while addressing people's real world needs is really the key. Their need for food, transportation, health, childcare, whatever. About it. So mattering, so to speak, is key. Make sure you interact with and care for everyone so they feel they matter. Because <clears throat> much of the polarization that's occurring, especially in the U.S. today, is a result of feeling like uh, people feel like they don't matter. Uh, and uh, that really uh, uh, creates tremendous anger and polarization. Um, uh, we don't have time to go into this in any other in great detail, but I also want to share that it's vital to build social connections among youth, BIPOC, residents, Black, Indigenous people of color, and other vulnerable groups, but don't isolate or fragment them. Um, in a pattern seen throughout history, 
when populations are defined as quote unquote vulnerable or at risk, or in other ways, they're different from others, then people often discount their importance or show little concern for their plight. Uh, and so focus on any group separately from others can easily revert back to the fragmented and silo approaches that dominate today, uh, at which can increase their segregation and social isolation uh, and, uh, and pit them against other groups for attention, funding, and other resources. So you really want to bring everybody together using a, a process called proportionate universalism. I'm not going to go through this in any depth because we're out of time, but there's universal focus on everybody. You connect that with targeted uh, uh, prevention strategies, which focuses on people who have characteristics that might lead to uh, problems. And then you connect all of that with people and it, with intensive work with people who are already experiencing uh, serious mental health or psychosocial problems. And you want to integrate the proportionate universalism what what are called life course approaches. So in addition to focusing on those different types of prevention, uh, you want to actually uh, engage, use different methods for different age groups. Uh, and this is important because people are typically exposed to different kinds of risks and adversities um, uh, at different stages of their life. So different protective factors should be used for children, adolescents, working age, and older adults. Um, and I just want to also say that if you really want to build collective efficacy and overcome that polarization, it's the building social connections in your neighborhood and your community that is really uh, key. Uh, that That's where when people come together and develop the belief that to, together they can achieve really important outcomes, they are much more likely to achieve that. So there's lots of research that shows in communities that believe that they can prevent crime. Research has found significantly less of that. Uh, and uh, bringing people together, residents together, can prevent uh, all sorts of inequities and injustices. Uh, and it's really in vital to engage residents in actions that reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, and other issues that uh, contribute to the climate crisis. So um, we don't have time now for any other questions, but if you have them based on what I just talked about or other things, please post them in chat and we will respond. I just wanna summarize uh, today by that building social connections is by far the most important focus of the resilience coordinating networks because it, uh, social isolation produces mental health problems, and both strong and weak connections are essential to deal with accelerating toxic stresses and disasters. There's a variety of ways you can do this. You heard of how Robin and Peace for Tarpon does it, a uh, very brief uh, description of Howard Lawrence's. Uh, there's many other methods. Uh, it should be a standalone focus, but it should be a focus of all the other strategies too. And, but when doing that, do not isolate people or use siloed approaches that segregate people from others. Instead, using use proportionate universalism and life course approaches. So uh, in closing, if you want CE credits, please remember to fill out the form that Christy posted in chat. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know when you'll get this, but remember to fill out the evaluation from the American Public Health Association for this session that will be sent to you, and then you can get the CE credits. Your homework for next week is please practice the control test daily and try to teach it to someone else. See how that goes. But just as importantly, share what you learned today about building social connections with two or three other people that you've already spoken to about forming a resilience coordinating network or expanding an existing one and discuss how and when you can apply it in your community. How can you begin to explicitly try to build social connections in your neighborhood or community and post the outcomes of your discussion in the CTIP climate website uh, forum website, if you would. And then also, if you can, develop an initial strategy and timeline for when you're going to begin efforts to build those social connections. So really do some work and Try to create a strategy and then let us know what you've got by posting it uh, in uh, on, on the CTIP Climate Forum website. And then we'll get together next Tuesday, March 12th, uh, to focus on the second foundational area, ensure a just transition by building healthy, just, and equitable, climate-resilient, physical-built, economic, and ecological conditions.
So with that, I thank you all for joining us today. And we look forward to, uh, I hope you have a good week. And we look forward to reading the information you post on the website. And we'll try to respond to that. And we'll see you all next week. Take care, everybody. Have a good week.